morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. Father God, we come before you this morning like newborn chicks, totally helpless and feeble in our own strength. But we thank you, Father, that because you sent your son Jesus, you have empowered us. You have filled us with who you are. Show us today what we need to know, anything about ourselves that's standing in the way of allowing you to be and do all that you desire to be and do through us, in us and for us. Show us what you want us to know about yourself, your love, your grace, and your kindness for the world around us, that you and you alone have the power to give them and you desire to give us the privilege of being the vessels through whom you give it. We thank you for that. And we claim your power to do it through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here's my question. What does the average American today think when they, when they hear the term like Christian? or Jesus, or church. You know, theologians and preachers like Billy Graham and Charles Stanley for the past 75 years have forewarned our present predicament in this nation, that our culture has finally forced the traditional American church to give them what they desire, a God who is all tolerant, accepting and loving of all behaviors, so we can live lives without, the, uh, without any conscience of sin, who after death we will enter into a kingdom without judgment, without the need of Christ or a cross. That's what our culture desires. And sadly, most churches in America have already tossed themselves on this scrap heap of wasted belief that's called in our nation now Christianity. Why has this happened, and how did we as a nation come to this point? And most importantly of all, how do we, those of us sitting right here in this room right now, how do we make sure that we as God's spiritual family do not wind up on the same spiritual religious scrap heap? Well, that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. As we take a second look at the encounter I touched on last week, between Jesus and his beloved disciple Peter in Matthew 16. And what's so important in this counter, encounter between the two of them comes when Jesus asks that all-important question, Who do you say that I am? As you may recall, Peter gave him the correct answer. And so that we don't take up too much time on the same scripture, we need to look into an aspect of what transpired then that impacts our lives today in the 21st century. Folks, you need to be able to accurately answer the question, what difference does it make who Jesus is and why his dying on a cross is any different from anyone else sacrificing their life for another? So here we go. In Matthew 16, 15, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? In verse 16, then Simon answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now the word Christ here is simply the word Christos in Greek, which means anointed one. What Peter is actually saying in Hebrew is, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And as we read last week in Matthew 16, 17, G Jesus answered him, and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, meaning Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, for today's purposes, here's what we need to focus on. Would you notice here that without any hesitation of any kind, Jesus immediately accepts Peter's identification of Jesus as the Messiah. Now look at this passage in Matthew 26. It said, Then the high priest said to Jesus, 
I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us plainly if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And then Jesus answered in verse 64, it is as you say. That when, he, when that happened, the room was filled with people when Jesus responded that way. Later in Mark chapter 15, Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, It is as you say. Listen. People in the first century knew exactly who Jesus was claiming to be. And we need to make sure that people in the 21st century, people in our lives, know exactly who Jesus still claims to be. Namely, he was claiming to be Jehovah God, wrapped in human skin, the God-man, the Messiah of Israel, and the one and only Savior of the world. This is how Jesus defined himself, and we must defend his definition. We must claim his definition without equivocation. We must claim who Jesus is regardless of the cost it will bring us. Look, if people want to deny Jesus, that's their right. God has always given them that right. Hey, it even happened while Jesus was walking around in human skin on earth. Surely, it's going to continue to happen right up past the rapture. If people want to refuse Jesus, reject Jesus, renounce Jesus, reproach Jesus, then that's their right. But the one thing that we cannot allow people to do is redefine Jesus and who he is and what he came for and what he stands for. He is who he says he is, and Simon Peter got it right in Matthew 16. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, I know for some of you, especially those of you who work uh, for the government or you're in the military, that there are some very explicit rules about what you can and cannot talk about while you're at work. For some, it even includes rules about what you can display uh, in your personal workspace, like a Bible or religious symbols. But that does not prohibit you. Think about this. There's no rule against having relationships with your co-workers and their families outside of work. There's no rule against having conversations with your co-workers outside of work personal interactions and conversations, somewhere or another, we must be willing to show others who we are, that we are people who are Christ followers, that we stand for Christ. And for some of you, it means coming to terms with whether you're truly seeking a real, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, seeking to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit living in you, or you just want to settle for the hope that you meant it when you said what you believed some time ago. My dear spiritual family, this is where we must be willing to suffer for Christ. This is where we must be willing to die if necessary for Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, we can't stop here with just the person of Christ. You say, well, what are you getting at, Sandy? What do you mean? What I mean is that once we get the person of Christ and we get it down right, it forces us to get the message of Christ right. That's the important part. You say, Sandy, I'm not sure I get the question. What exactly are you talking about? Well, it's a simple connection, and I'm going to put it in the forms of an if-then statement. If Jesus is God in human flesh, as Peter declared him to be, who died on the cross and rose again from the grave to cover our sins, then everything Jesus said, everything the Bible says about everything, must be utterly correct. And you have to make a decision about how important God really is to you. About how important knowing and believing everything in God's word. Do you truly believe it? Do you truly accept it? Or are you going to be one of those people who says, I don't have to believe everything in there. You know, some of that's just allegory or symbolism. It's not real. That's a decision you have to make. 
Are you going to be one of those people who just goes through the motions of Christianity just to placate your immediate family or your relatives or your friends or to keep your own conscience at bay? Some of you, I think, may be struggling with that. Do you see where I'm going with this? For example, what did Jesus say? He only, the main thing he said about salvation and eternal life is what he said in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. And there's the operative word. No one gets into heaven. No one gets eternal life, he said, except through me. Jesus said in John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Jesus is saying here that there is no other way to get eternal life than through him. And that's why Peter made his great confession in Acts 4, 12 when he said, For salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. So what did Jesus say about salvation? Jesus said that he is the one and only exclusive supplier of redemption, of salvation, and of eternal life to the human race. He said his way is the only way. He said his plan of salvation and eternal life is the only one that's guaranteed to work. The bottom line is that if Peter's identification of Christ is right, then his declaration there in Acts 4.12 must also be right. Now that's as far as I'm going to go today with this scripture because now it's time for us to stop and ask what difference does it make in your personal life. I want to help you with answering that question today because you see if you're honest with yourself some of you have probably gotten more concerned with whether you're going to offend someone if you talk to them about the fact that if they die and don't believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, that they're going to hell, if you give them what might be their last chance to hear from you what they need in order to be saved. You're more concerned about offending them than you are about their eternal life. Listen, in 1 Peter 3.15, it says, Be always ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope within you. And do they see that hope within you? Do they see that love and that joy and that peace and that grace exuding from you? Do they see someone instead who's always mm, down, worrying, mumbling, grumbling, negative about anything and everything, complaining? Because that's not Jesus. Notice that this is so true. What does it say there? Be always ready to give an answer, and how does it end? And do this with gentleness and respect. The reason why is because no matter how we say it, no matter how gentle and respectful we are when we're talking with others, no matter how careful and kind we are, the message of the cross still offends many people. The message of the cross, when given correctly, is inherently offensive to sinners who are rejecting Christ. And let me tell you why. It's actually a very simple reason. It's because when you tell people that they are hopelessly under God's judgment because of sin, when you tell people that they are totally powerless by their own efforts to fix themselves, no matter how good they are, or how many good works they do, or how much helping the poor that they might do, when you tell them that Jesus died on the cross to provide the one and only remedy for their sin that God is going to accept, when you tell them that they have to rely on what Jesus did on the cross plus nothing, what Jesus did on the cross, plus nothing. That they will miss he heaven if they choose any other belief. That they will wake up in hell. That every other religion, this is important now, 
that every other religion on earth is false and is actually an evil lie of the devil. Here's the reality. It doesn't matter how devout that Buddhist is, that Hindu is, that Muslim is, that Mormon is, that Jehovah's Witness is. It doesn't matter how devout they are. God is not going to accept that as a means of eternal life. Because Jesus claimed that there's only one way. And that's the message of Jesus and Jesus alone. Well, when you tell them, sinners react. That's just the way it is. And let me tell you why they react. The message of Jesus rankles their fleshly pride. The message of Jesus insults their sinful self-sufficiency. The message of Jesus lets them know that they can't do it their way and get forgiveness and eternal life their own way. The point is that the message of Jesus is inherently offensive to sinners. Folks, sadly, it's always been that way. That's why Galatians 5.11 refers to the message of Jesus as the offense of the cross. The offense of the cross. That's Galatians 5.11. The Bible tells us that when we share the message of Jesus, not only will sinners be offended, they will make us pay a price for sharing the love of Christ. They will make you suffer for doing so. If you haven't suffered for sharing Jesus with someone, I wonder how much effort you made to really share him with someone. That's exactly what Jesus said in the last half of John 15, 20. He said, remember what I said to you. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Now, this is a verse in the Bible that too many people would just as soon get rid of. Too many people are more concerned about being liked, about being accepted by their friends and their neighbors and their co-workers and their relatives than about the eternal destiny of their friends and their neighbors and their relatives and their co-workers. How much do you really care about them if you're more afraid of them rejecting you than of them one day calling to you from beyond the grave saying, why didn't you tell me enough? Why didn't you care about me enough to tell me what would happen to me? To tell me that I, how I could have avoided eternity in hell. That's not what Jesus said at all. In fact, the Apostle Paul did experience paying the price of sharing the message of Jesus. He was willing to suffer. Paul said in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three, I have been flogged repeatedly. Now you've all, most all of you, if you've seen the movie pa uh, The Passion of the Christ, raise your hand. You see, that's what flogging really looks like right there in that picture. Paul also said in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three, and I have been exposed to death over and over. Five times I repeat, received the flogging that they received from the Jews, 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Man, if you were ever around Paul when he had his shirt off, can you imagine what his back and his body must have looked like? Wow. Paul paid a real price for sharing the message of Jesus. And you're saying, well, Sandy, yeah, I'm with you on this. I feel bad for Paul and what he went through. But how does this apply to me today? Well, here's the truth. And there might be somebody in here who doesn't want to hear what I'm about to say. Some of you are going to ignore it. and Some of you are going to let it go one in one ear and right out the other. What all this has to do with you and me, friends, is that God commanded us to follow Paul's example. That is, give the message of Jesus exactly the way it's supposed to be given. And then, if there is persecution or punishment, accept it as a result. So what's that saying? It's saying, if you get harassed at work because you didn't hide your faith in Jesus, because you shared the true message of God's love, not some Hollywood, governmental, politically correct version, then you're to do what? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 
Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you when you suffer for the sake of Christ. I know some of you may not like hearing what you're hearing right now. Some of you just want to be a nice Christian person. You don't want to have Jesus' direction to share the good news about him, be part of being a Christian person. Some of you want to avoid his direction to share his message, to tell others about the need for trust in him, then that alone is the means of forgiveness for sin and the promise of eternal life. But can you deny God's word, which declares in Philippians, Philippians 1, for it has been granted to us for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. You're saying, all right, Sandy, wait a minute, wait a minute now. So time out. Let me get this straight. Are you saying to me that as a Christ follower, I'm supposed to go out and try to bring suffering on myself? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that if you do go out and share the message of Jesus the way Peter and Paul did, if you share the true message of Jesus the way he did, I'm telling you, you won't have to seek rejection or persecution or suffering at the hands of some people you won't have to go looking for it at all yeah my good friend of almost 40 years janice the person who no matter where i've pastored no matter what's been going on in my life and my family's life when i needed prayer for myself or my family she was always has always been the first person i called well, several years ago, her husband lost his job, and they both took jobs delivering new, uh, newspapers, two deliveries each, and then driving three rounds of school bus routes, three in the morning and three every afternoon, in order to make ends meet, to have health care, until they reach retirement age. They are retired now. And during this time, she, of course, had a middle school route. And one afternoon, as she's driving the bus, these two girls, as girls in middle school can do, got into a knockdown, drag out fight on her bus. And trying to be as careful as she could to end the fight, she was trying to talk to them to get them to separate. And she said, girls, don't you know God loves you? That God said that you are wonderfully and fearfully made, that he created you. You are worth better than this. You're worth something to God, and he, and, and he says you're better than this. Well, she got the fight broken up, but of course you can guess what happened, because one of those parents called the school, and the next morning Janice is hauled into the principal's office. She's read the riot act because she talked about God on that school bus in the front of the hearing of the children on that bus. She was suspended without pay for a week for having talked about God, trying to help these girls in this fight. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name because of me. And then he went on to say in verse 23, rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven for this is precisely how they treated the prophets. They threw Jeremiah into a well. They stoned Zechariah to death. They chased Elijah out of town. They cut the head of John the Baptist off. They stoned Stephen to death. They beat Paul unconscious several times. And they nailed Jesus to the cross. Why? Because some people did not want to hear when these men were all willing to just speak the truth. Jesus is saying, if you suffer, when you suffer, take heart. When they treat you that way, 
for telling the truth about me. For telling people what they need to hear. Rejoice. Because you're in good company. But did you know that research shows the Barna Group in their research found that many people when asked that if invited they would go with a friend to church but no one has ever invited them. Wow. Most people say that they would like to hear more about Jesus if someone were willing to tell them. Some, but not everyone, reacts with anger when they are told the good news. Look at it this way. I have two questions for you. How many people have actually treated you with anger and disdain because you tried to talk with them about spiritual matters? You know, it hasn't happened to most people. Maybe a little bit to some. And my second and final question is, have you actually spoken enough about the gospel or talked about it in a way in which others know very clearly what the gospel is? Have you even spoken about it enough and clearly enough for them to know what you're saying? If you do, you might make someone angry anyway because the message of Jesus offends sinners. But the reality is, it doesn't happen most of the time. It's your choice. No one will force you. But if you're truly seeking that closeness with Jesus, you can't help but want to share your good news. And that's what I want you to stop and ask yourself right now. Do you truly want to share the good news of Jesus with others? Do you really want to tell them what he's done for you and what he wants to do for them? You know, it'd be nice if you could go on a TV program like Hardball with Chris Matthews or The View or The Today Show and present the message of Jesus. And then when the show's all over, the host and all the stage crew, they're coming up to you and they're patting you on the back and they're shaking your hand and they're telling you what a great job you did. But if you were to stand firm on the fact that Jesus' plan of salvation is the one and only way into heaven, if you were to stand firm on the statement that you must trust Jesus as your Savior and Lord, or you will go to hell, if you were to stand firm and say to them that every other religion in the world is false and is a deceptive lie of Satan to mis designed to mislead and deceive people away from Jesus, away from the truth of the cross, do you have any idea what would happen when the show is over? Well, they're not going to rush up to you and pat you on the back and shake your hand. At best, they would avoid you and get away from you as quick as they could, but most likely, they would attack you in worse ways, both on and off camera, than you can even think of. Listen, the only way to remove the offense of the message of Jesus is to distort the message of Jesus. That's what our culture wants you to do. To sort of twist it a little bit so it doesn't sound so offensive. So it's more tolerant. So it's more accepting of anything and everything. We must be willing to speak the true message of Jesus. And you must be willing and able to share the true message of Jesus with those people that God brings across your path, and you know the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you need to say something to that person, whoever they might be. So how do you become the kind of person who can do that? You become the kind of person more concerned about showing them, showing them by your behavior love and grace and speaking to them truth with love and gentleness then you're concerned about being liked or being popular. You're not afraid of being rejected by them because you spoke to them. You're concerned about being true to the message of Jesus. Well, how do you fix that problem? Simple. You go back to sharing the true message of Jesus. You not only accept the offense of the cross, you embrace the message of Jesus and share it whenever the Holy Spirit is prompting you to share it. Now, 
How are you going to know if the Holy Spirit's prompting you to share it? You're not going to know if you're not truly seeking to be in a close, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're not spending time in, your, in, in His Word, if you're not spending time alone with Him, seeking Him, asking Him to lead you and guide you, you're not going to pay any attention when He's speaking to you and He's saying, yeah, I want you to just say something to that person. It might even be just say, hi, how are you doing? And see what happens when they respond. That's the kind of testimony we need to be hearing from people in our spiritual family. Stories about how you stood for your faith, even if you were persecuted. Has that ever happened to someone in here? No? Hmm. I don't know if that's good or bad. We need to be celebrating stories about the way you shared the fact that you've been changed by Jesus Christ. Have any of you ever done that? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I hope you have. We need to be hearing stories about the way a friend, a co-worker, or a relative responded when you shared your relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to be coming in here celebrating with stories of how God is at work. Like we were able to celebrate last week when Lauren shared a story and Paul shared a story about how God is at work. Maybe with a family member. Maybe with someone from your workplace. You know, this world of tolerance, this world of putting political correctness first, this world of Satan stooges like Bill Maher wants you to think that it's impossible to be a Christ follower and not offend anyone. Well, it's really not like that. And they want to make sure that you, you worry more about hurting other people's feelings than you are to being true to the message of Christ. When you read the Bible, you know that that kind of thought is impossible. You have to choose sides. And the godly side is not one of compromise. Friends, don't compromise the message of Jesus. Remember, some who are not true followers of Jesus are simply offended by your very existence, by the way they see you living your life, especially if you let them know that you're a Christ follower. Some are glad to hear what you share with them, especially when it's shared with grace and caring. And maybe you've been too afraid to share when you really didn't need to be so afraid. Because if you have bathed that person in prayer and the Holy Spirit's already at work in them, remember only He can draw them to Himself. Maybe He's giving you the privilege of being the one to take them to the next step. Your very existence may be a reminder to some people that they would dearly love to just get you out of their lives because they are bothered, their conscience is bothered by what you stand for and some of the things they hear you say. We're to be the harbingers of the message of Jesus to southeastern Virginia and to whoever Jesus brings across your path. 1 Peter 3.18 says Jesus was not guilty, but he suffered for those who are guilty to bring you to God. Are you willing to suffer to bring others to God? Mm. Christ came to earth for one reason, and that's what we've got to decide. Why are we staying together as a spiritual family if it's not to fulfill the Great Commission? He sacrificed himself to give us a second chance. He went to the cross where man's utter despair collided with God's unbending grace. And in that moment when God's great gift was complete, the compassionate Christ showed the world the cost of his gift. He who was perfect gave that perfect record to us and our imperfect record was given to him. And as a result, God's holiness is honored and his children are forgiven. So to conclude, let's add to the proven suggestions that we've been working on the past couple of weeks to help prepare you for sharing your faith. As you may recall, the first three suggestions to help your witness were suggestion number one, prayer, bathing the other person in prayer. Suggestion number two, just start relating.
getting in the habit every day of talking and developing even brief momentary relationships with people. Remember, hi, how are you doing? If you said that to anyone this past week, would you raise your hand? All right, okay, most of you did it, thank you. All right, suggestion number three was scripture. Immerse yourself in scripture. How can you be prepared to give a defense for your hope if you have not immersed yourself in scripture? And the fourth proven suggestion for preparing ourselves and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is to get some basic skills training. If you're truly a committed Christ follower, you'll have a hunger and thirst to share Jesus. So let's stop right there and you ask yourself, do I truly have a hunger and thirst to share Jesus? Because that's what the result of being truly intimate with him results in. Do you have that hunger and thirst to share his love and grace with others? And that means you want to get some basic relationship and witnessing skills training. You know, friends, there are lots of techniques for sharing our faith. But all of them are built around the same basic skills. Today's technique is one that I use most frequently. Because once you get engaged in a conversation with a person, and you get to know a little bit about that person, you can relate to them better than you could before you got to know them. And that technique is called sharing your own personal story in a compelling way. Sharing your own story about your life without Christ, how and why you came to trust in Him for your eternal life, and how He has impacted your life since that time. Now it takes some basic skills training to learn how to do that. So today after we pray, please allow me to just go through teaching you this basic skill that's been used to reach millions of people for Christ around the world. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we are so uncertain in ourselves. We are so reluctant in ourselves. We have worry and doubt and fear in ourselves. But Holy Spirit, I claim that if we're here today, we're here not just because we like each other, even though that's important. We're here not just because we trusted in Jesus for our salvation, the most important decision we could ever make. But we're here because we want to be the vessels through whom you use us, that this place is a place of worship and celebration, that we prepare ourselves like a training ground, like headquarters, to go out into this world where nine out of ten people we meet do not know you, Jesus, as Savior. And we are willing to do anything and everything you lead us to do to share with gentleness and respect your love with them. Father, fill my brothers and sisters with that hunger and thirst. Show them anything and everything they need to know to allow themselves to receive it. I claim that for them by the power of your name, Jesus. Amen. So, it was a month ago, in fact, it was the last Sunday in December when I brought the message. And the reason I know is because I sat at the table and we discussed the question, with Haley, who the next day uh, gave birth to her, her baby. And the discussion, the question was, how your life would be different now had you never known Jesus? So that's something we have already discussed. Today what I want to show you is the method that I most often use to share how it's different now because I do know Jesus. A technique with which nobody can argue with you. Simply because no one can argue with you it's because it's your own personal story. 
So watch carefully, and then I'm going to explain it and answer any questions you have about it. And then I want to give you time to make a few notes. I'm going to pass out some paper for you to do that and let you practice after you made some notes about your version of this, your own story, sharing it with the other people at your table. But I am going to ask you today to get up and make sure you're sitting with people who are not a part of your immediate family. So you can call this a 90 second or a three minute witnessing technique. It's the same one that's been used to lead, listen to this, in the past 10 years, in the decadent nation of Thailand, over 1 million people using this little method have come to know Jesus Christ and over a thousand churches have been established because of it in the last 10 years alone. And you know who they have go out and share this little method? People immediately, right after, the same day that they trust in Jesus. You don't need to memorize scripture. You just need to share your story. So let me give you a little example of how it works. You know, before I knew Jesus, I had heard about God, and as most people in our country have heard about God, but I believe that in order to ever be right with God, I had to make myself good enough and I tried and tried and tried to be good enough, but something in me kept saying I was never good enough. And no matter how hard I tried, I realized I was still not good enough. And it just compelled me, and I, I was so frustrated with the fact that I wanted to be a good person, but I doubted whether I was good enough for God. And finally, it was as though I heard God saying to me, Sandy, it's never going to be about you being good enough. You can't get good enough. All I'm asking for is a relationship. A relationship with me that comes because Jesus Christ died on the cross to take the punishment for your sins. And he rose from the grave to give you forgiveness. And if you've trusted and you believe in that then you can have that gift of salvation and a relationship with me. And because I have had that trusting relationship with Jesus Christ. He has changed me from the inside out. He's changed my personality. He's given me peace and joy and some of the greatest tragedies and some of the toughest times I could ever face. And I know that I could only be standing before you today getting through the things that I've had to get through in my life because of what Jesus has done in me. And I don't have to wonder when I put my head on my pillow at night if I should die in my sleep where I'll wake up. I know it'll be in heaven. Now, I don't know how that took, how long that took, but it was definitely less than three minutes. Do you see what I'm saying? You can tell your story. You can tell as little or as much as you want, but you want to just hit the basics. Some, uh, so... Again, number one, it's my life before I trusted in Jesus. Or, for those of you who grew up, in, grew up in church, what your life was like before you truly committed yourself to following Jesus. As Daniel has shared about the fact that he grew up in church, but what he was struggling with in his life before he truly came to that point of committing himself to Jesus. And number two... Why and how you did come to put your trust in Jesus for your salvation. Or again, for those of you who grew up in church, why and how you finally came, finally and truly came to trust and commit yourself to him. As Daniel has shared with us about what he did there on the deck of that boat when he came to that decision and why, what led him to it. And then number three, the changes, the difference that he has made in me since he came into my life. That's what you want to be able to share. That's your story. It's the truth. There's nothing anyone can argue about because it's just your personal story. When you share it with someone with whom you have bathed in prayer, you leave the Holy Spirit to let your story relate to and resonate with them. And let me quickly demonstrate it in a slightly different way, one more time. Before I knew about Jesus, I was not a nice person. 
I was a very angry person. I was a very impatient person. I could use my mouth and I could make you feel that big in no time at all. I, you would not have liked me. And I was not a person who knew or cared at all about Jesus or God or any of those kinds of things. But someone shared with me about Jesus and what he did. And they showed me that in the Bible it tells about Jesus dying on the cross for me. And you know what? When that happened, something happened in me and God just spoke to me and I knew it was real. And I knew that I needed to trust in him and let him change me. And I believe those words that I read that somebody showed me in the Bible and I put my trust in him and I committed my life to him and it made all the difference in the world. And ever since then, he has been changing me from the inside out. He's changed my impatience to patience. He's changed my anger to gentleness. And he's changed my crudeness and my rudeness to someone who's willing to be polite and kind and soft and gentle to others. Folks, I didn't do that. Jesus did that within me. That's Amen. one more version. Yeah. So whatever your story is, it's your story. So... Let me pass out. No, don't pass out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. We need a lot of If you want to. Just spread out so you're not great. sitting, just sitting with your own relatives. That means this table's got us. And if you don't have ink pens at your table, grab some ink pens. You want to maybe sit with James? <laughs> okay. A few notes about your life. Pretty easy, yeah. A few notes before your life. So start with writing down, just jot a few notes of the first three. There was a time. Things in your life. And after you write them down so that you can remember what you're saying, practice saying them. Share them with all the other people at your table, the three things that are there that you're writing about your story. And when you share it, remember, you want to keep it down to about a minute and a half to three minutes.